Hi there. Here's a quick one question quiz. What is the first word that comes to your mind when you hear the word refugee? Don't think, just your first thought. Do you think illegal or undocumented or something like unwanted? Now pause on that thought. All these words have a negative connotation to them. Why have we categorized some humans as illegal? Ever thought about that? These are people who fled their homeland in the face of conflict and war, fearing for their lives. Or do we think of them as illegal because they don't have any documentation? And can we actually do something about that? You are listening to News and Views and in this episode we ask how some lives have become so invisible that we don't even grant them the basic right to a secure life. I'm Priyali Sur, the founder and executive director of the Azadi Project, a non-profit that works for refugees globally, and I will be speaking to Swara Bhaskar, an award-winning actor and an advocate for secularism and human rights. We will be speaking to her about refugees, her activism, her support of the Bharat Joro Yatra and the cost she pays to stand up for what she believes in. But before we move ahead with the conversation, I want to tell you about some other Quint podcasts like Urdu Nama, Siyasat and Do I Like It? You can listen to these and many other podcasts by the Quint on your preferred podcast app. All right now, let's speak to Swara. So thanks for joining us. I'm going to start with a little bit about you know we have been discussing in the last 2 to 3 days a lot about refugee rights, about who a refugee is, the labels of illegal migrants. We've had experts here, refugees here. We want to know the point of view of an observer. As an observer, as a citizen living in this country, what do you hear? What do you see? And what do you, how do you kind of perceive the situation? that is happening all around us well uh, at the outset thank you so much priyali the azadi project rethinking refugees sindhuja and just this whole team for having me here she was very kind in introducing me i i i think a more honest introduction to me would be like i'm the most illiterate person in this room right now uh and so i'm even more grateful to have had this opportunity to listen to uh some of the conversations that i was able to catch i think it it's it's interesting to bring this whole conversation back to the lay person and if i can represent that in some way and represent the indian citizen who might mean well but may not just know enough uh then i think that might be a helpful way to uh maybe bring this conversation to an end and uh, start thinking like for me i think that uh, what struck me while i was listening to some of the speakers speak is that i was thinking about when did i as a person learn about the term refugee like how does a child living in india in these past 3 three, three and a half decades wh- how do we learn about refugees and the only thing you really learn is from uh, your textbooks when you're studying some of the other war in history class which you are looking to bunk because you're bored and and so it you're really learning about the issue in a very um sort of dry way where there's text and there's dates and there's numbers of people but there's no real human beings or human stories behind it then maybe you see the odd film called refugee that bollywood made and uh may not may or may not have fact checked the history uh while they were making it um some of us if we're lucky might have the chance to meet say a tibetan refugee which i did as i was growing up who became a friend but that's not a typical usual experience and in the last 10 years what do you hear when you think of refugee you keep hearing the term illegal immigrant illegal immigrant illegal immigrant being thrown at you so in in such a matter of fact way that it's part of the common sense that we don't even stop to say one second how can human beings be illegal i think that it's so important when we're speaking of these conversations and as you were saying when we're trying to mainstream uh this issue is to at the very outset problematize the term illegal immigrant because the moment you say illegal the rest of the population immediately starts feeling very like self righteous like they've done a great thing by having an aadhar card no man it's an accident of your birth you're just freaking lucky that you've been documented properly and your family has been documented properly there is so you know i think that it's so important to challenge this common sense and remove 
the idea of virtue and lack of virtue from being documented or undocumented and it's a huge thing it's a huge thing because look at the way in which um the 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 idea of the refugee has entered our popular mainstream discourse through the media in the last few years because these are groups that can be so easily weaponized to whatever your agenda is and i'll speak only about india because that's what i know uh, in the last 10 years you've seen the rohingya become a, a, an easy target and a, and a great and an effective weapon for whipping up communal propaganda uh during election time by the bjp and their um allied whatever uh you know uh, allied groups you've seen the uh bangladeshi uh immigrants again and again being uh, whipped up we've recently had a controversy where actor paresh rawal kind of made some derogatory remarks about you know why are you protesting the price of gas do you want to fry fish for bengalis and then when he was called out he said oh i meant bangladeshi immigrants as if that is any better we've seen in the last 3 years how actually you can weaponize refugees to change law to change the very nature upon which your nation is founded by introducing the idea of religion and citizenship as one thing uh, when we saw the caa uh, the citizenship amendment act come in in 2019 and of course there was uh, it was heartening to see the kind of protest that came up around it and then of course you have you know the right wing's pet project which they make a lot of noise about but what they actually do for it i don't know is the kashmiri pandit and then you know again uh, the trauma of an internally displaced people that can be weaponized so easily that can be glamorized that can be used as propaganda to to make films but but really are you even looking at what really their issues are what are their real demands you know the people who are left in kashmir the people who are outside kashmir so so i think that that you know the i think it's very very important for us as the lay citizens as the as the outside people who are is to actually start with problematizing the common sense and i think that that's why conversations like these are so important and it's so important for people like us who don't necessarily know the theory know the discourse know uh, the thing but are you know well meaning uh, well meaning people luckily documented and so uh, citizens of a place lucky to be in a country where there's no war right now there's no whatever uh, conflict no uh, genocide or etc uh, but 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 i think yeah i think that that's my great takeaway is that is that we we don't get to we don't get i have never heard i mean he listening to farhana is or meeting her and just like seeing her in person it's a huge thing i think what you're saying is that what has successfully been done in the last few years is dehumanize this and i think humanizing this through actually telling the real human stories is important since you spoke about the citizens uh, citizenship amendment act and i think you've been very vocal about it when we talk about stripping people of citizenship right this is what we have been talking about in panels What do you think about CAA when it comes to being discriminatory based on the religious identity of people? I think and I say this um uh, I say this with no doubt in my mind and I say it as emphatically as I can I think the intention behind the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019 was evil. I'll say it again. I think the intention between behind the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019 was evil because I don't think that that act was attempting to help the refugees uh, of uh, of uh, from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and I think those were the three countries that that were basically being uh, uh, looked at. Uh I don't think that was the intent at all. If you want to help those refugees, you have the law. Sahana talked about uh, about the different kinds of legal framework within which these things operate in India. You have the laws, you have the framework. Do it better. Just do it better. Be more efficient about it if you really want to help people. You have the you don't need to change the laws. The the fact is that the BJP was back in power with an overwhelming mandate. There is an ideological agenda that this government has. There's no point that we shy away from it. And the CAA is an ideological project of the Hindu Rashtra. It is a step to give constitutional basis to the hindu rashtra by linking citizenship to religion which is something that india modern india when it was born in 1947 very clearly self consciously dis- chose not to go down that path we are a secular country it is in our constitution it is in our preamble so there so to me the caa is it's it's very clear what it's trying to do 
And I think the way in which, you know, to link it to the NRC and to the NPR and to make it this huge bureaucratic project and then in this really insidious way endanger the citizenship of like 200 million plus Indian Muslims. I mean, what are you doing? Like, honestly, like, really, I mean, it's it's a it's a bad idea. It's evil. It, it, ethically, morally, it's evil. It is bureaucratically a nightmare. It's a really bad idea. You've seen the project, the NRC, and the kind of um, hassles and problems it's thrown up in Assam when the number of people who got left out and so on. Oh, what are you doing? Like, honestly, like, you just have to stop at that minute and say, what are you doing? And I think, just to bring it back to this conversation where I'm talking about mainstream, I think what was great with the CANRC is because it affected so many Indian citizens yeah. is that we cared about it and we mainstreamed that conversation and we got on the streets and we did something about it. Do you think it further polarized people as well? People getting polarized in, in the context of India today, when you have a when you have a dominant political power that feeds off polarization, when polarization is politically profitable to the people in power, you're not going to be able to escape polarization. I don't think we should be scared of polarization because it's happening anyway. I think what we have to do is to challenge polarization at every step, to call it out and to, to really relentlessly be doing whatever we can do at the personal level, at the interpersonal level, at like every time we meet a new person or in communities, in groups, in conversations like this, on our social media, is to kind of keep challenging that polarization. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think we should be scared of polarization anymore because it'll happen anyway. I think what we need to do is make more people see refugees as, as human beings, which is what which is really what this whole conversation is about. And, and also, I think we have to start questioning this idea that people's lives matter and that people have the right to existence and the people have the right to dignified human life only if they belong to a nation or only if they are documented citizens of a nation. That's not, that's just, that's, that's not okay. Even if you believe that, that's not okay. Like if, we, if this is what we, we think, we have to change how we think about this. It, nation states are creations of history, of politics, of particular, whatever, People have existed forever and ever and ever and people have the right to exist because they are born. It's as simple as that. I mean, I think you've said it exactly the way it should be said. It is a social political construct, basically, and people have existed forever. And I think the fact that people say that first let's help our people and then let's think about helping others is just an extremely non-inclusive approach. But Swara, you talk about, like, you know, said, call it out, call it out, call it out. Do you ever get scared? Are you threatened? How does it impact you? Uh, let's talk about emotionally first, about you personally, and then let's talk about how does it impact your work. Um... Well, okay, let's start for, first about how it affects my work. I'm uh, I'm like seasonally unemployed labor. I feel like, you know, I feel like the, the Indian farmer that every time the the weather changes and then they have like a lean period. So I'm I'm like that. No, well, on a more serious note. Uh, do I feel threatened? Am I threatened? Yes, I'm threatened. Am I, uh, do I receive a lot of slander and abuse? Yes, I do. Uh, has social media for the last eight years just been basically the experience of being Eve teased and cyber sexually harassed every single day? Yes. But um, I think you learn to, I don't want to seem too much like a victim because I also have a lot of privileges and I have a lot of, I have a lot of privileged identity that I think um, saves me. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I, I come from the majority community in India. I come from uh, a caste identity that is privileged. I come from, um, a, 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 you know, an upper middle class kind of social, cultural uh, capital, that kind of, you know, inures me a little bit. I'm educated. My parents uh, are reasonably secure. Um, and I am now, you know, somewhat famous. So all of this actually kind of helps you, uh, well, not be thrown in jail like all the other activists and, you know, people, students and professors who are languishing in prisons in the same cases that have also been filed against me. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of harassment. Uh, there is a lot of now attempt to kind of legally get you. So there's like 26 different criminal complaints that have been filed in various thanas. Uh, so there, there, there is that. But nothing has. Re I mean, I had a. There was one big scare. I had a contempt of court case that was moved against me that came like. But I was lucky. The uh, you know AG uh, sort of didn't think that I had done said anything very wrong. 
So it's the usual stuff, sedition, hurting religious sentiments, contempt of court, these are the three. They look for non-bailable things to catch you. There's harassment, but I don't feel physically unsafe. And maybe that's just the confidence of my identity and the confidence of my privileges that I don't feel physically unsafe yet. Um, I think the people have been very kind to me, which is why I always feel and I feel hopeful that there are a lot more people in India who don't agree with what is happening than they are with who agree. The only two times that I remember being, you know, negatively approached physically has been right before the 2019 election. Uh, one time was when some kid was like, oh, can I take a selfie with you? And then instead of taking a selfie, made a video being like, I got the Modi. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the second time was outside an election booth, same kind of thing, right on the day of voting. Those are the only two times that I remember. And once at a dinner party, someone said, like, everyone's over 18 here, right? Okay, yeah. Someone said, you to me in the middle of like a discussion. And it seemed like they were like, you know, from the other side. But other than that, I don't feel like physically unsafe. But uh, the But my producers do. And there is a, it, the, the impact on my work has been tremendous. I'm partly lucky that I can occasionally borrow money from my parents. And I'm partly a real idiot and a total deet. And like, you know what they say, like so thick-skinned and shameless and stubborn. Like I don't understand. Like everyone around me is like, what is it going to take for you to just shut up? Like just one year, just shut up for one year, just one year. So then we we have, my my team and I discuss timelines. So then they'll be like, ek saal ke liye chup ho ja, yaar. And I'll be like, nahi, teen mahine ke liye, release ke pehle. So there's, so the, you know, it's yeah, part of it is funny also. But yeah, the, 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 the fallout has been tremendous on my work. Producers are scared to cast me. Mm, I... Uh, you know, there's my work and everything I do gets weaponized very quickly. So if I'm doing like a, you know, if I'm if there's a sex scene in something I've done, they'll pick that up and then they'll run with that, weaponize that in whatever way they can. Um, all of it is organized. All of it is targeted. It really is not organic. I've now seen it and watched it enough to know that. Um, sometimes they employ, you know, influential right-wing trolls or even like minister-level people to kind of, you know, comment and create commentary. So there's all of that. Yes, but you know, I, I just feel like, I mean, it's two things. One, that I, this is the only way I know how to be. So the effort I'll have to make and then the like, the hassle in my head that it will be to not be this person is just too much. Like, I, you know, I pretend for a living, I cannot do it in my real life. That's one thing. The other thing is, and I really believe this, which is that, you know, uh, Ravish said this in some interview, and I, I think it's just different versions of that, and that's why all of us are here today. I don't want to act like I'm the only person doing this. There's a lot of people in India doing this work. I come from Bollywood, so I get a little more uh, attention than everybody else. The fact is that, sure, this is a fight maybe we'll lose, but we'll go down kicking and screaming. Like, history will not remember India as just sliding into this fascist, authoritarian, majoritarianism without a fight. They will record that there were people who said no and said no very loudly. And I think that there is a worth in that. And then the other thing is I also feel just personally, uh, and this is just coming from where I come from, I think it's hubris to imagine that your country will go to the dogs and to go, go to trash and you will magically be unaffected by it. I mean, what does that mean? That means you don't even live in this country if you're not affected by it. So really, I mean, it's fine. It's, you know, uh, it's, it's collater collateral historical damage, but I have a lot of hope. Because as I said, I really firmly believe that there are more people who don't agree with them than they are who agree with them. It's just that all of us just need to find a way to keep reaching out to each other and keep talking to each other and, and keep that up. And it's tiring. It's really tiring. So we have to find a way to take breaks and then come back and then take breaks and come back because it's relentless, but that's fine. Totally hear you on that. Um, I want to know how does a seasonally employed and a seasonally unemployed Swara deal with the many cases against her? Do you have a pro bono lawyer system going on for you? I have, I have, I have, uh, I, 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 I don't know why I have, but I have criminal lawyers on speed dial is what I have. Uh, yes, I have very kind people who have been so far, uh, I think I've only had to pay for one thing, uh, but they've been very kind and I get a lot of free legal advice and I'm always cultivating lawyers uh, <laughs> as friends. That's why, because I have an ulterior agenda and being friends with lawyers. But I'm lucky. I'm very lucky. I think that uh, I've got as much support and as much solidarity and as much strength from people as I have had uh, abuse and slander and cases and all. So I actually feel quite blessed. And I think that this whole this whole period has been it's it's a it's a bittersweet thing. I'm I'm happy for the battle, uh, and I'm uh, and I think that 
if you lose a little bit of work and you're, you're a little famous, but if you make some really strong, if you meet some really good people who are inspiring, whose work inspires you, if you make some good friends and if you have some strong solidarity networks, then it's worth it. So I have to ask you that I think it's great that you kind of voice out these opinions and you talk about this and you advocate for this. We definitely need that. But on a, on a level of policy change, the next step is that we need good policy makers. We need policy makers who can effectively bring about this change. We all saw you marching alongside Rahul Gandhi in the Bharat Jodo Yatra and you talking very emphatically, passionately about it. Do you ever think that you're going to enter politics? No, I feel like the, at this moment, the question is, will you be thrown out of the film industry and then have to just get into politics because you need something to do? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know because... I, I mean, well, one thing, well, never say never. Let's start there, so don't hold me to whatever I say right now. But I do feel that politics is not just electoral politics. Like, that's a very limited way of looking at politics. What we're doing here is politics. Um, enabling uh, or, or giving uh, Farhana a platform is a certain kind of politics, especially at a time like this. Um, Tenzin sitting here has spent his whole life, uh, I don't think you've ever done electoral politics, but that's politics right there. So for me... Uh, I think advocacy is a huge part of politics. Uh, and, and, and really, we always forget that our, our freedom is born from, not from electoral politics. Our freedom is born from advocacy-based politics. Uh, there is, in my mind, no greater politician than Mahatma Gandhi. And, and he was a strategic man. He was a very shrewd man. He was a shrewd politician. And he never... He never stood for elections uh, and, and, and held political position. Um, and so I, I, feel like, I feel like we have, we desperately need political education amongst ourselves in India today. And I, I think that definitely that's the kind of politics I would like to do and continue doing. Yeah, which is why I said we, we need the next level. We need the policy makers to be uh, bringing those changes, right? But... I absolutely agree that the things that we are doing now and the things that you are doing now are not uh, not distinct from politics. They are pretty much in harmony with that. Is there, you said you are a loudspeaker. I'm quoting you. Uh, is there anything that scares Swara that she does not want to talk about, that she kind of thinks that this is a territory that I don't want to kind of enter because this may be something that can be more... Uh, damaging personally, professionally, emotionally? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I, I, I think that I'm learning to be strategic about what I say and what I don't say because sometimes uh, you don't want to give them the opportunity to weaponize something you said and then that harms everyone, including the cause. So I think I'm careful. There's a lot of things I just don't know enough about. So I feel very, um, you know, which is a conversation I had with you right at the, the beginning of when we started speaking about being here, um, which is that, I, so there's lots of things I don't know enough about and then I don't want to be um, saying anything uh, because I might say something wrong or I might say something factually incorrect or, you know, some nuance I might not understand. And then, you know, I don't, again, I don't want that to be misused in some way. Um, I... Um, yeah, so I, I think I'm careful. Um, uh, the other thing I have to say is that I, and I know everyone keeps calling me an activist and it's not a nomenclature I chose. And I don't think I'm an activist because I think people, you know, activists are people like y'all who spend your lives on the ground doing things, changing things. I'm literally an actor. I get paid to say the lines that someone else wrote and perform to a camera that someone else is operating, uh, wearing clothes that someone else gave me, makeup that somebody else put on me. So, um... I, I, I now have learned to just be like, fine, call me whatever. But I do very firmly feel that, you know, this celebrity activism thing is a very, it's a very, um, it, it's a thin line, right? Because, because I really feel like causes shouldn't be important because some celebrity spoke about it. Causes are important because they affect people. And people are important. So whether or not a celebrity speaks for uh, a particular issue, that issue has to be important. You didn't need Richard Gere to come and tell us that Tibet's freedom or the struggle of, of Tibetan people for their identity was relevant. Yes, it's nice that Richard Gere came along and felt for it, shows that he's a good person. That's it.
that so in an ideal world scenario and unfortunately we're not in that ideal world scenario no. and so my last question from my side to you would be that do you think we need more celebrities? Do we need more people like you to come out and raise their voice and stand up with communities which are discriminated, stand up with communities which are marginalized and ask for their rights? Honestly, and I'm sorry I'm saying this and I'm sorry I'm the person saying this having, you know, come here on your platform uh, as a celebrity, but no. I don't think so, honestly. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's great if they do. If they do, if or if we do, I don't know. If celebrities speak out, maybe great. Great for them. Great for uh, the media. They'll get good, uh, you know, pictures and good quotes. But I think that... I think, I think what's really important if, is for causes to get mainstreamed in whatever way. And use celebrities. Use them. Use them smartly. I'm all for using celebrities smartly. But... We have to make sure that it's the it's the cause that keeps getting mainstreamed and not the celebrity. Um, uh, and I think that when and I, I say this again, I, I don't know. I say this because I'm an idiot uh, and I'm like revealing how we operate, I suppose. Uh, but but I think when causes become part of the common sense and when they become part of mainstream discourse, celebrities will hop on. We saw that happen in the Black Lives Matter with George Floyd's death in the U.S. And we saw that with CNRC as well. And this is not to say that celebrities don't mean well, that we don't care genuinely, that we don't, um, that we don't mean what we say, or that we have some ulterior motive. No, that's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that the aim has to be to frontline mainstream the cause and get as many people to come in. The moment that starts happening, and you will, the moment something becomes part of an accepted mainstream discourse, people will start feeling less scared, and more and more people will come, and they will face the brunt, but they will stand there, and they will speak out. And in India, we saw that happen with CNRC, we saw that happen with the farmers' laws. Um, so I think that there is a way that, and that is the way to approach, which is be smart, use celebrities, because you know, we're useless anyway otherwise. So use us well, um, um, uh, be strategic about it, but always I think that the aim has to be that the cause has to remain front and center and keep mainstreaming that cause. And it's, it's happened, we've had two successes in the last three years. That CNRC, everyone tries to make it seem like the CNRC failed. I want everyone to remember they did not go ahead with the NRC and the NPR. They have not yet. They, they did what they could with the CA because they could just bully their way into the parliament with it. But they didn't do it because they realized that the costs are greater than the... Uh, than, and and the, their purpose had been served. Um, and, and the farmer, farmers' uh, movement, of course, and that was completely, you know, that was completely the victory of the farmers and, and the people who were sitting there for so many years. So it can happen, I think, that the... You know, which is why, again, I, policy will change, celebrities will speak, when more and more people start picking up the cause and frontlining the cause, I think that that, that will happen as a byproduct. And that was our conversation with Swara Bhaskar at the event Rethinking Refugees, Azadi to Coexist in Chennai. Tell us your thoughts on this chat by DMing us on Instagram at The Quint. And to check out more of the work I do in the field of refugees and migrants and gender rights, check out The Azadi Project. This was Priyali Sur and I hope to see you in the next one. News and Views is a Quint original podcast executive produced by Shelly Valia and Ritu Kapoor. This episode was hosted by Priyali Sur and produced and edited by Prateek Liddu. The episode uses theme music from BMG and a special thanks to our guest, Swara Bhaskar. You were listening to The Quint's podcast.